Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're tackling a medium level problem called count covered buildings. This is one of those grid problems that sounds a bit complicated at first because of all the coordinates, but once we find the right perspective, it actually becomes quite straightforward. We'll break it down step by step. First, let's understand what we're being asked to do. We are given a grid of size n by n, representing a city. Inside this city, we have a list of specific coordinates where buildings are located. The goal is to count how many of these buildings are covered. Now what does covered mean here? A building is considered covered if there is at least one other building in all four directions, to its left, to its right, above it, and below it. If even one direction is empty, the building is not covered. Let's visualize the requirements. We're given coordinates as x and y. For a building to be safe or covered, it needs neighbors on the same horizontal line, the same y, and the same vertical line, the same x. Specifically, on the horizontal line, it needs someone with a smaller x to its left, and a larger x to its right. Similarly, on the vertical line, it needs a neighbor with a smaller y, and a neighbor with a larger y. Basically, it needs to be sandwiched in both directions. Let's look at the example to make this concrete. We have buildings arranged like a plus sign. Let's focus on the center building at 2. 2. If we look horizontally along row 2, we see a building at 1, 2 to the left and 3, 2 to the right, so left and right are covered. Now look vertically along column 2. We have a building at 2, 1 above, and 2, 3 below. Since the center building has neighbors in all four directions, it counts as covered. The buildings on the tips of the plus sign, however, are missing neighbors on at least one side, so they aren't covered. Just a quick heads up. We'll be walking through the solution using Python logic, as it's great for readability, but don't worry if that's not your main language. I'll be showing the full code for Java, C++ and JavaScript towards the end of the video, so stick around for that. Now for the approach. The editorial calls this simulation, but I like to think of it as finding the boundaries. A naive approach might be to take every building and scan the entire list to find its four neighbors. That would be incredibly slow if we have a lot of buildings. Instead, let's flip the logic. If a building has a neighbor to its left and a neighbor to its right, that simply means it is not the leftmost building and not the rightmost building in that row. It's somewhere in the middle. The same logic applies to columns. So here is our game plan. We will do two passes. In the first pass, we process all the buildings to figure out the boundaries. For every row y, we want to remember the smallest x and the largest x we've seen. Similarly, for every column x, we record the smallest y and the largest y. Once we have these boundary maps, we do a second pass. For each building, we just ask, hey, are you strictly inside the boundaries we found? If the answer is yes for both row and column, then it's covered. Okay, we've talked about the big picture and the logic. Now let's see what this looks like as actual code. I'll put the full solution up on the screen first, and don't worry after that, we'll walk through the most important sections together. All right, here's the Python code for the simulation approach. It's quite clean. We set up our storage, loop through the buildings once to fill that storage, and then loop again to count. Let's break down exactly how we initialize those arrays. First, we need to handle the initialization. We are creating four lists. Two are for the rows, to store the minimum and maximum x coordinates for any given y. The other two are for the columns. We make these lists of size n plus 1, because the problem usually gives us coordinates that can go up to n. We initialize the max arrays with 0, because any real coordinate will be larger than that. We initialize the min arrays with n plus 1, effectively infinity, because any real coordinate will be smaller than that. This ensures our first update always works. Next, we iterate through every single building in our input list. For a building at position x, y, we update our records. For the row y we check, is this the new furthest right building? If so, update max row. Is it the new furthest left? Update min row. We do the exact same thing for the column x to track the highest and lowest points vertically. After this loop, we know the exact edges of the cluster of buildings for every row and column. Finally, the counting step. We go through the buildings one more time. For each building, we check our conditions. Is the current x strictly greater than the minimum x for this row? That proves there's a neighbor to the left. Is it strictly less than the maximum? That proves there's a neighbor to the right. We apply the same logic to the y coordinate for the vertical check. If all four checks pass, we increment our result. It's always good to think about edge cases. What if n is 1? Well, in a 1 by 1 city you can't fit 5 buildings, so nothing can be covered. Our code handles this naturally, because the strict inequalities will never be true. What if all buildings are in a single straight line? In that case, they might have neighbors in one direction, like up and down, 
but they won't have any left or right neighbors. Our checks will fail for the horizontal part, and the count will correctly stay at zero. So how efficient is this? Let BAM be the number of buildings, and N be the grid size. We iterate through the list of buildings exactly twice. This gives us a time complexity of big O of M. For space we are creating four arrays of size N plus one. This gives us a space complexity of big O of N. This is very efficient, linear in terms of both the input size and the grid dimensions. All right, before we jump into the other languages, I want to quickly show you a personal project I built to solve a problem that always drove me crazy. It's an app called My Daily To Do. My biggest frustration with every other to-do app was retyping the same things every single day. Go to the gym, review code, work on the daily lead code problem. You know the drill. So, I built my app around one simple but powerful idea, separating your routine tasks from your one-off tasks. Routine tasks, marked with the little refresh icon, automatically reset for the next day. One-off tasks, like ship new feature, get the little puff of smoke icon, and they disappear for good once you're done. This small change turns a dumb checklist into a smart scheduler. If that sounds useful, you can try it right now on the web. The link is in the description. And one more thing I want to make super clear. Right now, as a thank you for being an early supporter, the app is 100% free. There are no ads and no subscriptions whatsoever. This means you get access to everything, including really powerful features like presets, which let you save entire task lists and load them with a single tap. Now down the road, creating new presets will likely become part of a premium plan to help support the channel. But, and this is the important part, any presets you create now, while it's all free, are yours to keep and use forever. So it's the perfect time to check it out on the web, play with all the features, and build out your perfect setup at no cost. If you enjoyed this problem and want to keep practicing, the learning doesn't have to stop here. I've organized all my video solutions into handy playlists. Whether you're looking to grind through more leak code easy, medium or hard problems, or you want to master a specific topic like sliding window or dynamic programming, I've got a playlist for you. It's the perfect way to focus your study sessions. Go to the playlist tab and find a playlist that fits your goals. Also, if you're looking for even more Leap Code problems beyond the daily challenge, I've started a second channel called Leap Code Unlocked. It's where I'll be posting solutions to a ton of other problems. So if you're serious about your interview prep, be sure to check it out. The link is in the description below. All right, that covers the main solution in Python. As promised, for those of you who code in other languages, I'm about to show the full solutions for Java, C++, and JavaScript. I won't be breaking these down, so just pause the video on your language of choice to check it out. All right, as promised, here is the full solution in Java. You can pause the video here to take a closer look at the implementation. Next up, here is the C++ version of the solution. Again, feel free to pause and review the code. And finally, here is the solution in JavaScript. Hopefully seeing it in a few different languages helps solidify the concepts. So let's wrap it up. We learned that sometimes the best way to solve a neighbor problem isn't to look for neighbors directly, but to look at the boundaries of the data set. By identifying the minimum and maximum coordinates for every row and column, we could check if a building was covered in constant time. This turned a potentially complex search problem into a simple linear scan. Hope this leak code solution breakdown made sense. If it helped, give that like button a click, maybe subscribe for more, or drop a comment if you have questions. Make sure to turn on the notification bell so you know straight away when I upload a video, because I upload videos daily. If you want to support the channel, a few people have asked how I plan my solutions. I'm a big fan of sketching out the logic and data structures on a tablet before I code, it really helps. I've put affiliate links in the description to the tablet I use and a few other good options. Using those links doesn't cost you anything extra but really helps me out. Or, if you're feeling generous, there's always the boba fund. Keep coding and I'll catch you in the next one.